الصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه أجمعين. قال تعالى: يا أيها الإنسان إنك كادح إلى ربك كدحا فملاقيه. صدق الله العظيم. وأما بعد May I say, what a distinct emotional <coughs> pleasure and joy I feel after all these years to be sharing a podium with the ambassador of peace, my niece, Princess Haya, Inter Hussein. Alam, Sheikh Muhammad bin Rashid Al Maktoum. Sheikh Muhammad, as we know, is a motivator of change and has attracted to Dubai the interest that this part of the world truly deserves. I make a confession here that the last time I was here was in 1966. So I can truly say I have never visited Dubai. And what I see here today is too difficult for me to fathom in a few short hours. But I didn't come here to tell you about the wonders of Dubai. I came here to say that in 1988, the Diet, the Parliament of Japan, the major importer of oil from this region, enunciated the real dilemma, the human dilemma of the West Asian region. You might ask me, why do I call it West Asia and not Middle East? Well, from Japan, we are the Middle West. Some people call us the Wild West. <laughs> and when we started the West Asia, North Africa Forum, our intention was to clarify that the Black Sea Eastern Mediterranean region knowing that the leader of ECHO today comes from Greece, just across the water from us. I think it is important to remind our European neighbors that we can be good neighbors on the basis of a two-way conversation. Focusing on the issue that the Japanese diet brought up in 1988. They said, and I quote, there will be no stability for oil in situ in the Gulf region. I know here it's very delicate to say Arabian Gulf, Persian Gulf. I was in uh, Tehran at the Non-Aligned Summit Conference in 2011 and our Persian friends and our Arab friends were debating this issue, not including the hinterland. And I reminded them that Gulf stability without the hinterland will not endure. When I speak of the hinterland, may I remind you of the fact that the refugee phenomenon is not new. I was a child in 1948, but camps were built for 1948 Palestinian refugees, which were then called temporary. I was a youth, finished my studies from Oxford in 1967, and we built refugee camps on water aquifers and the ministers of that time said 
in minister's speech. Don't worry, young prince, this is temporary. In 1991, we received one and a half million refugees from the Gulf War Zone. And I was trying to develop the ecosystem in the Badia region. We say in Arabic, al mushkila laysat bil badu, walakinnaha bil imabadu. Once again, we had an overhang of 300,000 refugees. And I am sad that in 1970s, in the ILO, there was talk of an international labor compensatory facility. That is to say that those who travel from the human resource rich countries to the natural resource rich countries should be tailor made in terms of education to market needs, should find what the outgoing president of the International Criminal Court said last week in an interview with Lionel Barber in the Financial Times should find reparative compensation. Today, from the perspective of Jordan, we host 1,398,260 Syrian citizens. Yet unlike Europe, where a broader patri patriotism exists, a European can be a German, a Bavarian, a Catholic, and a European. A Syrian today is only a Syrian in name. He is an additional digit, an additional statistic to the hosting country, whether it is Jordan, Lebanon, not to mention the internally displaced in Syria itself, Turkey, Iraq, and even as far as we are field as Egypt and Morocco. When will the time come when an Arab can be an Iraqi, an Anbari, and a Sunni? When a Syrian can be an Aleppan, Arab, and an Orthodox Christian? We are talking about the need for area capability, ladies and gentlemen. We are not talking about national and sovereign concerns because the concerns by their very definition are human security concerns that affect us all. The glass of water that we drink is shared from limited and dwindling sources in our region. The number of refugees holding the UNHCR card are 614,819. I want to remind the UN agencies that each one of you is very concerned with his or her administrative responsibilities. It would not be appropriate for me to speak of turf walls, would it? But I want to say the time has come for us to recognize that all of us in this hall are not important, including myself. You don't have to put your earphones back on because I'll say it again in English. <laughs> I, Al-Hassan bin Dalal, the humble servant of my Creator, plead with all of you to make this Dubai round an opportunity for an appeal to the
the international community to stop talking about the Middle East when in reality they mean, what do they mean? They don't mean Iraq, they don't mean Syria, because one day it's Kobani, the next day it's Sinjar, the third day it's Gaza, the fourth day it's Raqqa, and so forth. We are being mosulized as we speak. When will a generic name emerge for this region? And when will people start to think regionally? I remember with Joe Biden and Richard Lugar in the Senate hearing years ago, they said Middle East, and I said, what do you mean by Middle East? They said, well, from Marrakesh to Bangladesh. <laughs> from Casablanca to Calcutta. I said, are we talking geography? Are we talking poetry? Are we talking trade? Let me remind you that from the coast of Morocco, from Sijilmas, to Malabar for six centuries, 600 years, Pacific trade was pursued by Arabs, Jews of Arab culture, Christians of Arab culture, and Muslims of Arab culture. And then one day, Vasco da Gama arrives and says to the Jain king, kill the traders or expel them or I will kill you. The Jain king, being a pacifist by belief, says, what is killed? And the rest is history. Today, we are being told about the benefits of globalization. But for six centuries, the fact that we traded Arabs, Jews, Christians, and Muslims, and quote, unquote, if you go to the Cambridge University, I mean Cambridge, England, library to the Ben Zakaya synagogue Geniza, you will find the bills of lading between Arabs and our Hindustani brothers. Let us not forget that in some great part this gulf is also the Hindustani gulf. I would like to remind you that adults account for 47.7% of refugees, 25.6% are women, 27.1% are men. As for Iraqis, let us not forget the Iraqis, with the overhang of 300,000 Iraqis, I asked, I pleaded with the affluent, the rich Iraqis, the ones who walked away with bundles of money, let us not forget that $8 billion walked of the Oil for Food program. Anyone in this hall who can tell me where they went, I would be very appreciative. Walked with Saddam's money and walked with international money. They came to Amman, I said to them, why do you not support a $500 million fund which the United Nations would be happy to manage for the less fortunate Iraqis who have come to this country. Do not misunderstand me. I am not talking about financial handouts. If you go to a refugee camp, as I'm sure you all have, and you sit with the young, they don't want handouts. They want to pursue their education. They want to fulfill their potential. They want to be enabled and empowered in law. So I'll make this short, as short as I can. Iraqi Christians, I thank Caritas for taking care of 6,000 people, most of them registered under ACR. But we still have in Jordanian churches, Mar Elias, Marshall, Our Lady of Peace Center, Latin Church and Syriac Church, hundreds of people and the trickle continues. I want to ask you two things. One, can you underline the need for what I call, I referred to in Arabic earlier, as institutional self-determination by the people of this region? 
Why does every region in the world have a bank for reconstruction and development except for this region? Why do Arabs serve on the board of the Asian bank and the African bank and European banks? Well, I was asked to speak on behalf of the Moroccan, the Tunisian and the Egyptian at the G7 meeting of Sherpas in Jordan a couple of years ago after the Arab Spring. And I said, what have I got to do with it? They said, oh, you know how to talk to these foreigners. <laughs> so talk I did. And the German said to me, but why do you need a regional bank? You have the EIB and the EBRD. I said, I am talking about social cohesion. Are you prepared to pay the social cohesion bill of Greece? or Spain, let alone the Arab world. The reality is that the sovereign wealth fund managers have to develop a conscience in terms of the human security of this region. The correlation is not between development and sustainability in material terms. The correlation is human dignity. The real security threat to our region is people who are the vectors of ideas, good or bad. A Swiss lady said to me the other day, oh, may I ask her a question? I'm so embarrassed to have to ask her this question, but I said to her, Madam, would you please ask the damn question? She said, are you really an Arab Muslim? I said, yes, I believe I am. But why all the embarrassment? She said, but you're so normal. I never thought of myself as normal. I mean, that, that, by the way. But I said to her, um, look, if we are one and a half billion Muslims, and 20% of us, that makes 300 million, are muta'assibun, extremists, Assuming that 100,000 of the 300 million carry weapons. Because I remember another Swiss gentleman, he said to me, Oh, you're not a Muslim, you don't have a beard. I said, well, I started with my moustaches and I'm continuing with the beard. <laughs> but if you'd like, just give me a chance to get my AK-47 and then I'll prove to you what kind of a Muslim I am. My point is that the 300 million are those who have chosen the alternative polity, the alternative economy, the alternative society. The hatred industry, trillions spent on weapons, drugs, money laundering, And you know the story very well of the difference between GDP and GNH. When will we live to see Global National <coughs> Happiness Index? I want to see Al Hayat Tayyiba, economic wellness, Al Hayat Tayyiba al Iqtisadiyya, environmental wellness, Al Hayat Tayyiba al I thank the University of Stockholm for starting an interdisciplinary center, eco-social. So Hima, an old Arabic concept, an old Arab concept is not only the physical environment but also the human environment. What about physical and mental welfare? Of the 130,000 school children on the Ministry of Education books in Jordan, I would say up to 80,000 of them deserve counseling. There are very few NGOs that I have worked with who actually are concerned with mental welfare. Post-conflict stress disorder. I personally suffer 
from situational stress disorder. Because I can see the words coming out of my mouth and going nowhere. And this has been the case for most of my life. Five decades I have dealt with refugees. From 81 to 88, and please look up, winning the human race. We sat in a commission calling for a new international humanitarian order. Robert McNamara from the United States, David Owen from England, Simone Weil herself a Holocaust survivor from France. In those days, there wasn't an Israeli Prime Minister who was coming to France to say, well, I'll have all the French Jews as well. You know, the game and the pain. The game and the tragedy is that everybody is playing with three letters. T-I-M. Territoriality, identity and migration. And everyone plays it according to his position, geopolitically. So one, can we have institutional self-determination without a well-being index, reparative compensation? Two, can we talk in this gathering of the crisis of survival in relation to a, an incremental approach to a Helsinki process? Today is 2015. A hundred years ago was 1915. Two years from now, or three years from now, a hundred years ago, there was a Versailles conference. Would it be possible for us to work incrementally on advocating the refugee issue in terms that could fit into a new Berlin Congress. If all of you were asked by the great and the good, the leaders of the G7, what is it that you want to stabilize the region? Can you produce one piece of paper without a thematic approach? Europe started with coal and steel. Can we not start with water and energy for the human environment? The Strategic Foresight Group from Mumbai, with whom I work as chair of the Blue Peace Project, indicated that since November 2014, almost 40 incidents have taken place in the Middle East where water was used as an instrument or a target. In addition, the report proposed the formation of a UN peacekeeping force for water. That's all very easily said. Somebody proposed the other day a UN peacekeeping force for heritage sites. I don't think the UN is doing pretty well much in peacekeeping. What we need is to start peace waging. I would like to see us actively committed to building the peace that we desire. The United Nations calculates that by the end of 2013, there had been more than 51 million people worldwide displaced because of warfare, violence, and persecution. More than half of them were women and children. And here we are talking about democracy, citizenship, the future based on human dignity. And let me remind those Muslims in the hall that zakat, we saw the reference to Ihsan on the transparency earlier, zakat does not concern Muslims alone. Ibn Sabil, wayfarers, stranded travelers, travelers who are traveling 
on a human goal, towards a human goal. A fulfillment cannot reach their destination without financial assistance. Fi sabilillah, those who are fighting to create a better future for themselves cannot effectively reach that goal. The problem is that the essential in the development of the world is a word "world." It is found in the word "world." The whole is about the development and the whole is about the development. The biggest problem about zakat, when I say universal, is the word universal. Everyone talks about conditional zakat. And I am described as an activist. May I describe myself as described by others as seditious. When I say zakat should be accountable and transparent. There is a sleeping giant of goodwill that could be directed towards enabling and empowering in law civil law as well as religious law, people who are deserving of our support. May I thank you for listening to me. I don't know what use my words have in such meetings. I'm, I'm almost speeched out. But I want to say to you that I do believe in swimming upstream against the traffic. I do not believe in the creation of the end of days. <coughs> if the day of judgment comes and you have a fruit bearing sapling in your hand, plant it. I hope that this meeting is not just about talking at each other, that it is a meeting where we talk to each other and listen to each other and develop one more modest step of hope for those who are important, the millions outside this hall who look at us and wonder what exactly it is we are doing for the future generations. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.